Sorcerers. The following is a production of the Sorcerer Radio Network. It's from imagination, huh? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, broadcasting from the Tiki Room Studios in Music City, it's the Disney List. The Disney List. You've got to have characters that the audience, the viewer, the reader cares about. What makes a hero? What's friendship? What's the idea of sacrificing yourself for something larger? With the hope that it will be a source of joy and inspiration to all the world. Disney List on Sorcerer Radio. With your hosts, Kristen and Al John. Welcome, one and all Disney fans worldwide. It is the Disney List. Lifelong Disney fan, Marvel fan, Star Wars fan, Al John Go here. Back at you with yet another show with my lovely and talented co host with the mostest, Miss Dining at Disney herself, Kristen. Hello. Hello. I noticed that you stole my pillow. I stole your pillow. Right here. Yes, your winking Mickey Mouse emoji. I, there's not enough Disney in this room, you know. We just moved into this new house, so we haven't Disney-fied the house yet. So this is, other than our T-shirts, that is the Disney, <laughs> that's the Disney decoration thus far in the, in the Tiki Room studio. Hey, listen, everyone, we have an awesome show for you lined up. Uh, we're going to talk about Disney books. We're going to talk about all kinds of great Disney lists. Of course, the Disney list weekly dose of your list of favorite Marvel, Disney, Star Wars, and of course, the Disney parks. And we are also celebrating the 65th anniversary of Disneyland, my home park, my first park. I love it. I love it. Chris, Kristen and I have so many adventures and memories from Disneyland, don't we? Yes, mine are all in my adulthood since growing up on the east side. I didn't get to go until my first trip was in 09. I, my very first trip to Disneyland, I was seven, eight years old. So back in the um, early, early 80s, back in the early 80s. But uh, I, I love the park. And someone else who loves the park just as much, if not more than we do, would happen to be our guest today. He just happens to be what we like to call a Disney guru. He's done so many things for the Walt Disney Company, worn many hats as a special effects supervisor, uh, as, gosh, he's done everything. The director of special projects, working with different theme park attractions, and, of course, renowned author David Bosart. Hello, David. How are you? Hey, how are you? Thank you very much for having me back on the show. I really appreciate it. And uh, I I really uh, just thought it was terrific that we could make this happen, especially with the 65th anniversary of Disneyland's opening. Oh, absolutely. And by the way, they say the second time's a charm. I understand. (laughs) Uh, The first time we actually did this, this is the second intro we're doing because I forgot to hit record. But uh, you're absolutely right, David. I mean, what a great time. You know, it's, you know, globally, it's, it's, it's difficult because the park is not open. Everyone is still trying to shelter in place and trying to keep safe and trying to keep healthy, which obviously, Dave, David, I wish you all the best with you and your family and friends and making sure they stay in good health and good shape. But it is nice that we can all come together to celebrate, at least virtually, and celebrate Disneyland. I, I, I agree with you, and I, I, and I, I hope all... I hope you both are are being safe and and are well and the same with all your listeners out there and viewers. Um, I, I've been in a self-imposed, uh, you know, uh, self isolation uh, since uh, the middle of March, uh, and my hair hasn't been this long since the eighties. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, I, I did shave though, because I was letting the beard grow and, and my wife, Nancy looked at me and said one day, you know, you're really starting to look like a hobo. Uh, (laughs) So so I, I, I decided I would shave and let the hair grow because I wasn't going to brave it and go out to a, a hair salon, even when they started to open some of them, which they have now since closed again here in California. So we're, we're being very safe and staying indoors and what's amazing is that we can all get together through technology and do these kinds of things where i can see you and what what city are you in i don't even know where where you guys are but nashville tennessee you're in nashville tennessee okay and i'm out here in los angeles and i just got off a two and a half hour zoom session 
with a whole bunch of Disney historians that were scattered all over the United States. And it was just a, a lot of fun to be able to have that connection, even though we're all self-isolating. Exactly. It's called Together, it, uh, Separated But Together, right? Yeah. Together but apart, apart but together. Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to uh, Yeah, apart but together. <laughs> apart but together. The one thing that I have found is I have been in contact more with my friends who are out of state than ever before. Now with being isolated and using technology all the time to connect with people, that my friends who are in, you know, Florida and California and places like that, that I talk to them much more than I do now than I did when we could go out and do things. Yeah, and I, I, I just find that just so, it, it's so much easier today uh, than, than it was, you know, even 10 years ago or 20 years ago. It, it's so easy to jump on these different platforms and, and, and actually see people and have a drink with them virtually uh, as if you were sitting, sitting across from them uh, at, a, at a restaurant or, or something, you know? Oh, yeah. We call it virtual happy hour. That's right, virtual <laughs> happy hour. I love that. Well, this, this next uh, half hour to an hour, we're going to be very happy talking and celebrating Disneyland. David, your new book, 3D Disneyland, will be coming out soon. Uh, the, the, the actual title is 3D Disneyland, like you've never seen it before. In a land far, far away. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, we, we got to throw in the voice. I didn't throw in the reverb this time. But, um, you know, the, the great thing about this book that, that, is, that I love is it's a time capsule. It, it really is. You know, as we, we talked about at the beginning of the show, I went to Disneyland my first time back in the 80s. Kristen went in her adulthood. And looking back with not not just the love and nostalgia that we have but just to see how the park has evolved over the course of these 65 years with this kind of reference is amazing can you tell us a little bit about the book yeah you know there's an interesting backstory to this book project because the seed was planted for this book probably 25 plus years ago and um i worked with a guy named Ted Kiersey. He's a master special effects animator. He was somebody who was trained by the nine old men. Uh, his mentors were Ollie Johnson and John Lounsbury and Eric Larson and, and some of the other guys. And uh, he uh, started working at the studio in 1970. Now, I'm gonna take you back a little bit further in time because when Disneyland opened in July of 1955, that's 65 years ago this week, um, Ted was there that week. And he was, uh, he was 10, 11 years old. And several months before Disneyland opened, he bought himself a Kodak Aniston stereo camera. And the stereo camera allows you to take the left and right eye view photos. So that gives you the stereo uh, or 3D effect in the photographs. And, and essentially what I like to tell people about 3D photos is that you're not just capturing um, a moment in time, you're catch, capturing a moment in time and space. Uh, and when you see these 3D photographs, they're, they're going to blow your mind because some of them are just unbelievable. And uh, so Ted, so, so Ted uh, was uh, shooting 3D pictures throughout the 50s and into the 60s. And uh, while he was in high school, his arts, art teacher uh, uh, pushed him to submit a piece of artwork to an art contest. And the grand prize for the contest was a scholarship to Chouinard Art Institute in Los Angeles. And Chouinard, uh, some people don't know this, but Chouinard was the predecessor to Cal Arts out here in Los Angeles. So uh, Ted wound up winning the grand prize and received that scholarship from Walt Disney himself. Wow. He met Walt Disney, he, Walt handed them the scholarship, they shook hands, there were some pictures taken, and Ted graduated high school, started going to Chouinard, 
and he wound up getting a draft notice. And instead of, you know, going with that draft notice, he immediately called the Naval Shipyard in Long Beach and said, my grandfather was in the Navy and my father was in the Navy, so I'm going to enlist in the Navy rather than go with this draft notice to the Army. And they said, come on down, we'll, we'll sway you in right now. So he got sworn in that evening, and the next day called uh, the, uh, you know, he followed up on the draft notice and basically said, well, I've already enlisted in the Navy. And they're like, okay, you're good, you know, and that was it. So uh, he went off and he did his service in the Navy and uh, w went over and, and was in Vietnam for a couple of years and uh, finished his service, was honorably discharged, came back to Los Angeles, started uh, up his schooling again at Chouinard, and then in 1970 got hired uh, at the Disney Studios. And uh, so when I got to the studio in 1984, he was one of the first people I met. We became fast friends and, and it's been a, you know, we, we've been friends ever since. So, in the early 90s, we were splitting an office and working on Beauty and the Beast and other projects. And uh, he brought in some of these slides that he had in a special holder. You drop the slide in, you press a button, and it illuminates the back of the slide, almost like a, 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 like a high-tech uh, Viewmaster. And yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and so I got to see these incredible photos of uh, of Disneyland from the 50s. And and by the way, the first time I went to Disneyland was in 1980, 81. Uh, I actually grew up on the East Coast. So I went to Disney World first in 1976. That was my first exposure to a Disney park. And, uh, and then when I came out to Los Angeles, of course, I, you know, I, I made it down to Disneyland and I've been there countless times since, but, um, you know, Ted showed me these slides. And one of the things I said to Ted at the time was, man, these should be in a book, Ted, got to put these in a book, you know? And so, you know, Time passes, I start writing books, uh, Ted retires, you know, he's in his upper 70s and moved out of Los Angeles, but we stayed in touch, we talk on a regular basis, and I've gone out and visited him. And on one of my trips where I went out to his home and spent the weekend, uh, we got to chatting and, and the subject of those 3D photos came up and I said, Ted, we got, let's do that book. We talked about it 25 years ago. Let's do that book. And he says, okay, let's do it. You know? And so that's really how this 3d Disneyland book came about. I, I actually wound up writing the text, which is a little bit about, uh, 3d photography and about Ted and Ted's journey and, you know, his interest in 3d and, and his affiliations at Disney and everything. And so there, there's a little bit of text at the beginning of the book, but the bulk of the book are these photographs, which are just mind blowing. Some of them, they're absolutely incredible. What I In love, fact, yeah. I, I put up a picture of Tomorrowland yesterday um, on my Facebook page and I put up the regular sort of flat 2d image. And then I put up a 3d image in case people at home had a pair of these uh, 3D glasses because these come in the book. Love and that. so you just put these on and you look at those 3D photos and it, it just comes to life. And what was kind of cool was Ted and I went through all of his photos, his slides, and we picked out the best, uh, sort of the cream of the crop. It was just almost just under a hundred photos. And, uh, and then, uh, we arranged it so that the, the way the book was designed and laid out, you're going on a walking tour around Disneyland uh, clockwise. So you start outside the berm uh, where the train station is, and then you're in the, uh, the, the town square, and then you go up uh, Main Street to the plaza, and then you hang a left over into Adventureland, and then uh, New Orleans Square, 
uh, Critter Country, uh, Rivers of America, Frontierland, The Castle, Fantasyland, um, uh, a couple of shots of some of the fountains over in Toontown, uh, and then Tomorrowland. And of course, we're visiting the various train stations in, the, in those areas. So you get to see the trains and uh, uh, it's just, it, and, and, and as I was putting this whole book together, I wanted people to see Walt. I, I felt like Walt needed to be in there. So I bookended the photos. They start with a Walt Disney photo, him dedicating Fantasyland. And some people may have seen those photos before, you know, but they've never seen them in 3D. You haven't seen Walt in 3D. And so we use some digital technology, uh, some inflation techniques to create a 3D image of the two photographs. So at the beginning, you've got Walt in a blue cardigan holding the plaque for Fantasyland. It's in 3D and it just, it's mind blowing when you see it because it's like he's standing in front of you. And then at the very back of the book, there's a photo of Walt, and again, some people may have seen this photo of Walt sitting on a bench in an empty Disneyland looking down Main Street towards the castle, and he's sitting in the town square. Well, that now is in 3D. You get to see him sitting on that bench in 3D, which is really kind of cool. And that is absolutely amazing. Super cool. What a great way to book in a book. I'm going to have to get out my 3D glasses because I know I've got a pair. Yeah, you're and, you will. and check out that picture. That is so cool. Yeah, so you know, I've been putting some stuff up on social media because I'm, you know, I, I honestly just teasing people. And somebody said, "Hey, you know, what does it look like in 3D?" You know, because I was putting up the 2D versions of some of the images, and I said, "Well, okay, well here, here it is. If you have a pair of glasses, you know, put your glasses on." And and the reaction was like, "Wow, oh my gosh, that's like so 3D." So people who have the the magenta and cyan glasses like like these um you know they're they're able to see the full 3d effect of that that photo i put up and and by the way the book comes with a pair of glasses so when you open the book up there's a little envelope you just pull out your glasses and put them on um and and you know this was again a very this was a, little, a labor of love. I mean you know I I view Ted as being a mentor and a friend of mine at the studio and a, you know an animation colleague, uh, Disney animation colleague. And so it was just fun to be able to do this project with him. Uh, you know we're both retired from the studio, but it was great to be able to get together and do a project together. Uh, and, uh, and these photos, I just felt like they just need to be shown out there. I think people are going to gobble this up. I mean, I never saw the house of the future and I never saw, you know, the, uh, the chicken of the sea pirate ship or the skull rock lagoon or, you know, any of those things, they were all torn out by the time I got to Disneyland. Yeah, all the all the great uh, all the great ve vegetation, <laughs> you know, all the great plants and trees. <laughs> well, and you know, something that's yeah. the thing, though. I mean, you you hit it on the head when you when you look at pictures from '55. All of the vegetation and the trees are just really small. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at some of the 3D photos from 1980, from the 25th anniversary, holy mackerel! You know, it's like how everything had grown in, you know, and it just looks so spectacular. Absolutely. You know, uh, once again, folks, David Bosart is our guest today, and we're talking about 3D Disneyland like you've never seen before. The new book, which will be coming out soon. And, and David, where can people check out all of your works and pre-order this book? Okay, so great question. There, There's two places you can go. You can go to my, uh, I have an author website, uh, which is davidbossert.com, David, D-A-V-I-D, Bossert, B-O-S-S-E-R-T.com. So David Bossert's one word, dot com. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of material there. There's, there's articles I've written over the years that people can access for free and read, uh, all related to uh, Disney for the most part or entertainment. 
And, uh, and then, you know, this book is not formally releasing until October 15th on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million. But I decided because of the pandemic, you know, you got to kind of roll with the punches, I guess, you know, and it was, we're not doing any book signings, you know, I mean, the bookstores aren't open to accommodate them and maybe they might be by Christmas. I don't know. But even so, like Ted's in his upper seventies, he, he's in a vulnerable group uh, uh, for this virus. And so, you know, we're, we're just not going to be able to do any kind of appearances or book signings with it. So I decided that we would do a limited edition version and that would be, both Ted and I are going to sign the book, um, which is a story in it itself because Ted does not go to fan events. Uh, and he just, you know, people are never going to get him to sign a book because he just doesn't go to those kinds of events, you know? And so I'm having him over to my home on a weekend when the inventory comes in and we're going to sign a bunch of books but not only sign them, we're numbering them. So oh, wow. it's, a, it's a numbered limited edition of the book. And there's a special, we had a special holographic emblem made up that will have the number of that book on it that goes in the book with our signatures. And so now we thought that would be a great thing to offer out to the real, you know, like the fans, like you guys and me and, you know, like the, the real park fans that are out there, we thought, well, this would be a good thing to do for them. But then we took it a step further because we, we dropped the price 20% from the uh, issue price of the book and we're throwing in free shipping. Oh, so, oh. so all I can say is, if people go to the publisher's website, which is theoldmillpress.com, theoldmillpress.com, that's all one word, right? The Old Mill Press is one word, dot com. Uh, they'll, they'll see a pre-order now button, and they just click that. It'll take them to the 3D Disneyland book page, and they can purchase the book. Now, the book is... The issue price on the book is $65. There at the publisher, they're going to be able to get the book for $52 plus free shipping. And it's going to be signed and numbered. And I have to tell you, as the orders have been pouring in, the orders are going out in, in the order they've come in. Oh. So for, first in, first out. So if somebody, you know, somebody send, sends me an order today, you know, they're going to be whatever the number is at, at that moment because I'm writing it on top of the, uh, the, the order. You know, it's being written there. And that's it. You know, so that's all I can say is we tried to do something, you know, for everybody out there who's self-isolating. And the one thing I would say is that with 3D Disneyland, like you've never seen it before, the park is always open. I love it. It's love always it. open because that book will sit on your table. And when you're sitting there and you're getting a little depressed because of this pandemic is dragging on, you're going to be able to open that book and put on your 3D glasses and go, wow, I'm at the park. You know? I'm at my happy place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It'll cheer you up, you know? So oh, that, that's great. The old mill press.com. You'll be able to check that out. Right, Dave. The old yes, press dot com is yeah. the link. We'll have it in our show notes. You'll have it here on the, our lower third. So you can just click the link. And of course we'll also link uh, David's website as well. Um, you hit on so many different things uh, on there and we're going to have an opportunity for one of our lucky listeners, viewers to actually yes. pick up one of these books, right, Dave? Yes, absolutely. We're, we're going to give one away to your audience. And, uh, and I think that'll be really fun. Um, you know, the, the one thing I, I, I want to say about that, and I, and I don't think I mentioned this, 
the limited edition is only 750 signed books. Mm -hmm. that, that's good to know. And you, you, you guys know that that's like a pretty low number for, for a book like this. Uh, that, that, that's it. And, and once those are gone, they're gone. Um, and the other interesting thing is, is that if people do order the limited edition, they're going to have it probably six weeks before it actually is available to the public. Wow. Right. Cool. So <laughs> I don't cool. know. We, we tried to make it as special as possible. And I hope I, are people, I mean, the reaction has been pretty good so far because I, I shouldn't say pretty good. The, the reaction has been absolutely fantastic so far. Uh, so that that's the cool thing. No, it's very cool indeed. Uh, 3D Disneyland, like you've never seen it before. Get up, the, get the pre-order now in limited quantities with all of the great holographic stickers signed by both of you guys. I, I, I'm just looking forward to checking it out for myself. So I'm going to get in that queue right now because Disneyland and Disney fans know how to queue up, and that's what we do. <laughs> so, um, but but there are so many things um, about not only this book, as you said, it is a a time and space captured within this book. I'm a huge fan. Several things that you mentioned. Not only are we big fans of Beauty and the Beast and the Black Cauldron and, and the works that you've mentioned uh, in your history with the, the Walt Disney Company and in animation, but you talked about the Viewmaster. I love the Viewmaster. One of my favorite toys growing up. Um, my grandparents bought one for me when I was uh, growing up. On, I was on the West Coast growing up in Seattle. And when we first went to Disneyland, we had a Viewmaster. I, I got that. And then it had all the different slides from the park. Um, and my dad also, who worked for, for uh, Boeing, also had a 3D camera. So he would take pictures of different things, um, mostly jets <laughs> that he was working on. And we'd have 3D, you know, 3D, the, the little, you know, the little quasi projector thing that you hold in front with the, the, the picture on it where you, you would have that 3D image, you know, on there, whatever it was called. It was a 3D something. <laughs> so this is super. The 3D viewer. The 3D viewer, yes. <laughs> of course, it's a, you see, back in the day, they had actual simple names for things, not acronyms or anything. Oh, but uh, yeah, that is good. <laughs> but, but this is just so great to see the evolution of Disneyland, to see it with this stunning 3D capture, um, which to me, is is really nice because it it's old school technology that still does its job it's you know and and dave you know from your experience working in you know special effects technology when you were doing animation and such you know there's still something nice about the old school way just like we have an affinity for hand-drawn animation to see this in in that style you know that you know that that mid mid century modern style that also you capture in your books, you know, this is just so great. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, I, I've been picking and choosing projects that I get a lot of joy out of and, and, and really have fun working on. And this particular project was incredibly fun to put together because I was just awestruck at some of the photos um, and and the fact that we get to share those uh, the get to share those photos but um, it, it's also spawned some other projects that I'm gonna work on uh, because I do feel as though this is one of these things it's a simple technology but it, it brings photos to life and, and we took a lot of care in how these photos are being presented in the book because we, we actually have a lot of white space around the image. And what the white space does is it creates what's, what we call a windowing effect. So, so the, the white of the page acts as like a wall and the photo is a window and it actually helps enhance the 3D quality of the image. Nice, nice. It's like a gallery. I yeah, like that. I mean, it's it's really it's really kind of neat. But I, you know, uh, so far the, the in, in fact, if people go to the Amazon page for this book, uh, you'll see some quotes from Don Hahn, 
from John Canemaker, from uh, John Musker, George Scribner, Alan Coates, Claude Coates' son, uh, who and Alan was an Imagineer himself. Um, you know, they I sent it out to those guys to look at the book and to give me their honest feedback. And they gave me some wonderful jacket quotes that, that we included on the book, but we're, we also put up on the Amazon page, you know, just to, just, just so people know that this is, this is something special. I love that. I mean, you just listed off a who's who of just Disney animators, great producers, great directors, artists, yeah. directors. I mean, Don's been on the show before. So I, you know, it's it's super cool that all you guys are in touch like you are. And you hinted at something um, when you were talking about your introduction or your first uh, entry into the Walt Disney Company. You talked about CalArts um, a little bit. CalArts, as a lot of hardcore Disney fans know, uh, has been basically the uh, like the bakery of Disney greats. Right, the spawning they, grounds. The spawning grounds. You know, <laughs> Walt Disney's animation school. You know, right. So everybody yeah. walks in, they leave, and they they do great work with the Disney company. When you were at Cal Arts, how what was the vibe like um, it, when you were at Cal Arts? And your some of your classmates um, that that had moved on and worked in different films. Can you name some of your your different classmates that maybe you went to school with? Sure. I mean, you know, first off, like when I, I was at Cal Arts from 1980 to 1983, and at that period, uh, Jack Hanna was the head of the animation department, and a lot of Disney animation fans will recognize that name. Jack was a story artist and a director. He directed a lot of the Donald Duck cartoons, and if I'm not mistaken, I think he directed all of the Chippendale cartoons uh, that the studio produced in the 40s and 50s. And uh, he headed up the animation program. They brought him out of retirement to do that. Wonderful guy. I got to know him. Um, there was Bob McCray, who had worked in the animation department for decades at Disney. Uh, we had uh, uh, Ken O'Connor uh, doing layout up at CalArts. Uh, my, uh, my life drawing teacher was Elmer Plummer. Uh, and uh, Elmer Plummer had... Um, uh, designed the dancing mushrooms for Fantasia, among many other things. Uh, Teehee uh, was another one of, he was our caricature instructor, uh, just a terrific cast of people. And then in my class, I have people like Rob Minkoff, who went off on to, to direct uh, Lion King and Stuart Little and Haunted Mansion, a bunch of, bunch of uh, films. Uh, uh, there was um, uh, uh, Gary Trousdale, uh, Kirk Wise, and, and some of these guys may have been the year ahead of me or a year behind me, but we were all up there together, you know. Um, there, there was uh, just a, an incredible group of people that went through during those years, and um, uh, a lot, of, a lot of fond memories. And by the way, I'm still very much active with Cal Arts. I'm on. Uh, I'm a member of the board of trustees of Cal Arts. So, so I, you know, I, I've, I've stayed involved with the school and and helping the school out o over the years. That's amazing. Am I? You know, before I became a musician here in Music City, when I was growing up, and I tell, I, I've told our listeners this before, my wife knows, I want, I, my dream was to either become a penciler for Marvel Comics or to be an artist, like a background artist for Disney. There you go. And, and that is just amazing how all this works, works out. Um, yeah, and, and in yeah. fact, yeah, I was going to, you, you mentioned background artists. I'm very good friends with James Coleman, Jim Coleman, uh, who headed up the background department for many years uh, at Disney and, and, and is now, uh, uh, you know, a fine artist who, who does, uh, he, he has some, you know, Disney paintings that he does uh, as part of his repertoire. Uh, wonderful guy. And, you know, you, you just make all these lifelong friends in the industry as you do in music too, you know? Absolutely. You know, this is great. Great stuff indeed. And you've touched on so many uh, different projects, of course, working for Walt Disney Animation. Um, 
was there a particular story from all the different movies you can uh, you've uh, you've worked on whether it's you know great bounce detective or one of my favorite two framed roger rabbit uh, or even the Black Cauldron. Is there a particular story that you'd like to share, a funny story um, that you can share with our audience about uh, your time working in animation? My gosh, you know, we worked on so many films through the years and, you know, every, every one of those films has, has their stories and fun times. And I think probably... And I often tell people this, what, one, of the, one of the most memorable films I worked on was uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit because I worked on it in London. So I, I actually lived in London uh, for a period of time during the production of that. And, uh, and I just, I have so many wonderful memories because the animation crew was so diverse and there, there were people in the animation industry from all over the world. Uh, working on that project. We, we had people from South America, from Asia, from uh, continental Europe, uh, from Canada, the United States. I mean, it was just this melting pot of artists that made that movie. And I remember the first day I went into dailies on that picture and, uh, and I was blown away. Uh, and you got to remember, we, we did that film pre-computers, pre-computers. So it was all the, all the animation was combined and all the special effects were done with optical printers, all with film. Uh, and it was really pretty amazing because I, I actually saw that film a couple of years ago again uh, in a theater because of the 25th anniversary of it. And it still holds up. I mean, it's still a great movie. And um, I, I just, you know, remember when I came out of Daly's that day, I thought to myself, wow, this is going to be like the biggest movie ever, or it's going to be the heaven's gate of animation. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all I could think of, you know? Oh. And, and, and for those who don't remember heaven's gate, it was, <laughs> it was this like massive budget disaster that happened around that time. So, <laughs> oh, man. oh man, he had to bring it up. Hey, um, once again, Hey, you, at home, you listening uh, to the show or viewing the show will have an opportunity to win 3D Disneyland like you've never seen it before, David's new book. It's going to be in store soon, but in the meantime, don't forget to pre-order today, and we'll have our links there in the show notes. Um, the, so many of these films, are uh, they're, they're all iconic. They're all legendary, and one of them, yes, Christmas. One of them is one of my favorites, and it's The Nightmare Before Christmas. Yes. I love that movie. Yes. Well, you know, fun, funny thing about that, I, 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 Disney Editions, the, the publishing group at Disney, uh, they, they asked me, uh, I don't, it's got to be three and a half years ago or four years ago, they asked me if I'd be interested in writing a behind-the-scenes book on Nightmare Before Christmas. And I said, you, knew, you do know I worked on that movie. And they were like, no, we didn't know that. And I said, well, I did. And of course, I'd love to write this book. So I actually wound up writing uh, The Nightmare Before Christmas Visual Companion. Uh, Tim Burton's done the uh, foreword to it. And I wrote that book, I think, three years ago at this point. I think I've got a couple of books that have already been published. That one, literally this past week, I just finally got the uh the book layout as a file that i'm going through right now i have to do some caption writing and some odds and ends uh before it can go to the printer but that book is coming out next year well we have to have you back to talk about that because not only you working on that but of course one of our favorites tim burton just the style the stop yeah. animation just so much about that film is great well and you know What's, what's wonderful about that film was it was an incredibly personal film for Tim. Uh, it, 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 it's something that he really cared deeply for and still does. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a, uh, important to the animation industry because it was the first time a major studio backed a stop-motion feature-length film. 
You know, a lot of us were, you know, grew up on Ray Harryhausen uh, and where he had some, you know, stop motion in, uh, you know, sequences in a, in a live action film. Uh, we, we grew up on uh, Gumby and Pokey and uh, Davy and Goliath and, you know, all of those kinds of shows. And, but nobody had really done a full on feature with a major studio. I think, I think, um, Will Vinton had done like a Mark Twain claymation film, but, uh, but it was really Nightmare Before Christmas that was, you know, backed by the Disney studios that went out there as the first big stop motion feature film. And that really kind of opened up the floodgates to do more, uh, um, uh, more stop motion films. And now you've got Leica Studios up in Portland that are doing some fabulous movies. I mean, Kubo and the Two Strings and, you know, some of the uh, box trolls, you know, just absolutely fantastic films. Uh, and they've taken the stop motion art to, to a new level. But when you look at Nightmare Before Christmas, you can see the hand of the artist in that, uh, in that film. You know, it, you can really feel every frame, it's touched by an artist, uh, and, and it's just so wonderfully done. And it has such a heart to the story. That's, that's why it has resonated and continues to build a, a, a wide uh, audience following. How brilliant is Tim Burton? I mean, really. <laughs> You know? you know something? I, I, I think he, I, I, I think he's a wonderful uh, artist. I mean, he, he's, he's somebody who has a vision. He has a very strong vision, uh, and and you can see uh, his his you know design, um, uh, uh, you know his his design sense throughout all of his films. You know, whether it's Edward Scissorhands or Ed Wood or you know, Beetlejuice, uh, you know, even the Batman movies he did and, you know, some of his more recent films, uh, Alice in Wonderland, the live action version and Dumbo, you can really, you know, see it, see that, uh, what they, what they refer to as Burton-esque, uh, quality to, to the films, you know, and that's, that's all Tim's vision. I love that. I love it. Another thing that we do love, you know, sticking with animation, is the love you have for Oswald. I'm showing the love for Oswald right now, wearing the shirt. And we didn't get a chance to talk to you when this book was released, but can you tell us a little bit about Oswald the Lucky Rabbit in your quest to document the lost animation? Yeah. I mean, this was this was a sort of a serendipitous type of story because I was in my office at the studio. I had a meeting that had dropped off my calendar, so I had a very rare little window of time. I, I think it was like an hour of of nothing going on in my you know my world, and I I was in my office and I happened to see an article online about a lost Oswald cartoon that had surfaced at a private film archive in England and it was going to be auctioned at Bonham's auction house as part of a Hollywood memorabilia uh, auction and I I thought wow that's kind of cool I you know I kind of feel like you know Disney Disney should probably buy that I don't know and just as I I'm thinking that and and I finished reading that article and I get this little ding uh, an email had come into my inbox and I and I click on it and it's from uh, Ed Catmull who was the president of Disney Animation at the time and he had some question that was Oswald related that somebody had come to him with and so he reached out to me and I I of course responded to the to the question but I ended it by saying oh by the way this lost Oswald cartoon just surfaced and it's at an auction and I think Disney should buy it uh because Walt directed it you know and he wrote back he says yeah that sounds like a good idea I'll, uh let's let's ar arrange for for you to do that and you know they put the money in place and I went off and I I was able to purchase it at auction um, and and repatriate it back to the to the company, and and I think what's super important about Oswald and there was only twenty six 
possibly a 27th, you know, that there is a 27th film that has Walt's name on it, but we're not sure exactly whether he had only, you know, his studio did some preliminary work on it or what, but his distributor clearly put his name on it as a way of, uh, from a continuity standpoint. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's a that's a whole nother story. But but for argument's sake, there's 26, you know, Oswald cartoons that Walt had directed, produced and directed and made at his, you know, Disney Brothers studio. And, um, you know, he he lost that character from the standpoint that he never owned it. A lot of people say, oh, he lost the rights to Oswald. Well, he never actually had the rights to Oswald. His producer, Charles Mintz, had the rights to Oswald. And Walt was a contractor who was making the cartoons. So when Walt went back to New York to meet with Charles Mintz about getting more money for the next round of the, the second 26 cartoons, uh, ultimately, uh, Mintz wasn't going to give him any more money and wasn't going to give him the contract to do the 26 new ones. Mintz wound up setting up his own Oswald cartoon studio in Hollywood and signed away a lot of Walt's artists to work on the, on those shows. And so that was a huge blow to Walt. Uh, but it was a life lesson to him that he vowed he was going to own his characters after that. And while he was finishing his contract for Oswald, he was working at night and on weekends with Ub Iwerks and his brother Roy O and a couple of trusted artists. And they were making those first three Mickey Mouse cartoons in the garage of their homes. And Lillian, Walt's wife, Lillian Disney, and Roy O's wife, Edna, they were painting cells on their kitchen table for those cartoons. And, you know, it, it, it just shows you that how, how different people react to setbacks. You know, Walt, Walt gets a punch in the gut, loses the Oswald contract, but he doesn't, you know, go hit a bar and drink and cry about it over, you know, over a beer uh, and piss and moan for the, rest of, uh, for the rest of the years. He turns around and says, well, we're going to do our own thing. And he invents Mickey Mouse. <laughs> so for me, the Oswald cartoons are the foundation to the Disney empire. You know, the Alice cartoons, you know, uh, they made money on and they had some reasonable success, but it was the Oswald cartoons, which were his first big animation success. And then he built on top of that with, with Mickey Mouse and then the Fab Five and the rest is history, as they say. But when you look back, those 26 cartoons, so it was, it was incredible that Bob Iger was able to get the rights to those 26 cartoons back from Universal uh, back in 2005, I think it was. And you know, really, it's it was all all Bob Iger who who repatriated Oswald to the company, which I think was the right thing to do. You know, they weren't going to make a bundle of dough off of it, and a lot of the films are going to fall into public domain soon. But it was the right thing to do because it's part of the heritage of the Walt Disney Company, and and I think that's you know transcends everything else. I think that is just such a great thing that. A, you were able to document, you know, and help find, you know, that that those lost films and, and at least share the different pieces that you were able to, uh, you know, put together for that book so the rest of us could enjoy it because this is stuff we'd never see. We'd never get to, to track down those people that had those pieces or even walk into the Walt Disney Archive to check out all that stuff uh, there to, to see for ourselves. But you know, he is the building block. Oswald is great. And I think it's awesome that you were able to compile all that for the Disney fans. Yeah. And I think the, the other neat thing about it was that one, once we purchased, that was uh, uh, the film Hungry Hobos that we got at the auction. I started to think to myself, well, if Hungry Hobos was out there, uh, maybe there's some of these other lost titles that are out there. And so, um, 
I got the studio to, to allocate a little bit of a budget for us. And, uh, and I brought on a consultant named David Gerstein, who's based out of New York. And, uh, and so we went to hunting for a rabbit and, uh, and wound up uh, repatriating a half a dozen lost cartoons back to the company. Um, and, you know, and I think that's just fabulous. And just, by the way, a year and a half ago, um, a portion of Neck and Neck, which is a lost cartoon, a portion of that, two minutes worth, uh, surfaced in Japan. And the guy that had it is 85 years old. He's owned the film since 1951. Oh, my. And he reached out to me because of the Oswald book, because he thought it, 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 the film he had had a title, if you translated it from the Japanese, the title was uh, Speedy Mickey. Uh, <laughs> and so they sold it as a Mickey cartoon, but it wasn't Mickey. It was actually two minutes of uh, neck, uh, neck and Neck for, uh, of the Oswald cartoon. And so uh, I, I authenticated that, that two minute clip as being, neck and neck uh uh one of the lost walt disney oswald cartoons and uh and he was gracious enough to to give a copy of it to me uh and he donated the actual film to a film museum in japan which was wonderful on his part because it'll be taken care of and preserved and all of that that's awesome that's awesome yeah and, you know all, all of these projects have these wild you know fun uh, uh, stories and offshoots to them. It's uh, that that's the enjoyable part of it all. I love it. Uh, I, I I can't wait for our our viewers or listeners to check out all the great books that you have on the website. We're going to talk about that and an opportunity for you to win the new book 3D Disneyland, like you've never seen it before. Um, oldmillpress.com, the oldmillpress.com is a place that you can pre-order a very limited edition of that very same book with a holographic sticker signed by uh, both you and Tim, right? Yeah, both me and Ted. Oh, Ted, Ted. Ted. Yeah, yes. yeah. Ted, Ted, Ted and I are going to sign those 750 copies. And and I have to tell you, they're going fast. I, I just had a gallery send, send us a note this morning uh, saying they wanted to reserve 100 copies. Oh, so, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, we, we can't wait. You have to be within the intercontinental United States. Okay, so I apologize to all of our overseas viewers and listeners. You know, we'll make it up to you somehow. But in the meantime, all the intercontinental United States, a continuous United States, and we're going to make sure to get that information. All you have to do is like all of us there at the Disney list and our social media as well as Dave's social media. We'll have those links in the show notes. Now, we want to be respectful of your time, David, but you know, uh, I wanted to talk to you about uh, the Dolly and Disney Destino and, and, and so many things, but we will probably end up having to save that for another visit when your next book comes out. But uh, Kristen, you've got some questions. I was going to say yeah. that, you know, Disney's Coronado Springs recently, in the past couple of years, did a whole like makeover and built the Destino Tower. Yep. And that was based on, on you know. Destino. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's definitely a great book for people who want to know more about the, about that. I mean, it's, it's really cool if you haven't been over to see that part of. The, I, I've only the, seen, I've only seen pictures of it. And uh, I, I think uh, the pictures I, I saw were fabulous. It looks spectacular. Well, I, I can't wait to talk about that because once again, that you reunite um, with Roy E. Disney as well uh, yeah. for that, for that particular piece, which coincidentally was also nominated for an award, you know, so like an Academy Award, an Academy Award, the Academy Award, you know, so you know, and th and there's a really funny story. I don't know if we have time for yeah, it. Yeah, sure, go ahead. It's food related, so I, okay. I, think, I think Kristen will like this. Okay, um, it, you know, uh, we went to the Academy Awards because it was nominated for an Academy for Best Animated Short, and. Uh, Roy was uh, Roy and Dominique Monfrier 
uh, who was the director uh, for the short, they were the two nominees. And uh, there were four other films that were in competition with us. And you have to remember during that time, uh, Roy was in a spat with Michael Eisner at the company and there was all kinds of stuff going on. But um, when uh, they announced the winner, uh, Roy was just about ready to get up. He had his hands on the armrest of the chair and he was like starting to push himself off before he fell back. Like, oh my gosh, we didn't win. And a, a, a film, uh, one of the other films was uh, Bounding, which was a Pixar short. And, and this, again, remember, this is before Disney bought Pixar. So Pix Pixar is an independent company owned by Steve Jobs at that point. But they had a short called Bounding that was in, uh, uh, in competition and nominated. And then there was a short film from Australia called Harvey Crumpet. Uh, and, and I honestly cannot remember the other two shorts that were in competition with us. But what we believe happened was that um, uh, Destino split the vote, essentially. Um, in other words, uh, uh, some people were voting for uh, for Bounding at Pixar. Some people were voting for Destino with Disney. And it paved the way for Harvey Crumpet to come through and win the uh, statue. <laughs> and so, it, and it was kind of, you know, it, it, certainly, look, anytime you get nominated for, for an award, you know, you're thrilled by it. But, you know, Whenever you hear somebody say, oh, I, you know, just being nominated is the honor and da, 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 is baloney. Everybody wants to win. <laughs> they want to win the prize, you know? Well, and, yeah. yeah. Well, that is the prize. I mean, you wouldn't want to, you would want to show off the Academy Award and have that Oscar right there, you know? Oh, yeah. I, exactly. But it didn't happen. And so we, you know, I, I, we were, uh, Nancy and I were up in the balcony and, uh, uh, Roy and Dominique were down uh, uh, in the orchestra seats and uh, Roy's uh, wife at the time, Patty, uh, and uh, producer Baker uh, were in seats elsewhere. Anyway, it just came down to, we all met up in the lobby of the Kodak Theater in Hollywood after the award ceremony, we're standing there with Roy and there's a small group of us and Steve Jobs comes over to say hi to Roy. And, you know, uh, there was other people. I, I actually, uh, when I was in high school, my high school social studies teacher was uh, Alexander Baldwin and uh, his son is Alec Baldwin right. <laughs> uh, and Billy Baldwin. The two Baldwin brothers were there and, and I was chatting with them. And, uh, and, and so it was, it was just sort of this crazy evening, but the way the Academy Awards work is the nominees get tickets to the governor's ball afterwards, right? And so, uh, we didn't have tickets to the governor's ball. So we were all set to go home. And uh, Roy was like, well, you know, what do you want to do? You know, do we want to go to the governor's ball? I was like, well, Roy, I don't have tickets to the governor's ball. Went, you know, Nancy and I are fine going home. We'll take the car home and, and send it back for you guys and blah, blah, blah. And we were all kind of down, you know, because we didn't win. Uh, and finally, Roy says, Patty, what do you want to do? And Patty looked at all of us and said, well, I'd really like to go to In-N-Out Burger. Yeah. You know? yeah, and, yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, and so to, 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 say, to make the long story shorter, uh, we all got, we piled into our limos and we went to In-N-Out Burger uh, on Coanga Boulevard over by Universal Studios. We had right. a, a box of burgers and a box of fries, and we went back to Roy and Patty's house, and he corked the bottle. Of, uh, it was a, uh, um, a magnum uh, of uh, red wine, a fabulous red wine, and we, we ate hamburgers and fr French fries and drank red wine and until like one o'clock in the morning, just talking and everything in, in their dining room. And so that was a very memorable evening for me, even though we didn't win, we, we still, there was, there was still a wonderful memory there, you know? That's really I, yeah. cool. 
You know, it is an <laughs> awesome story. First of all, I commend you all for going to In and Out Burger. It's yeah. one of my favorite must dos. When and, 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 and by the way, I will tell you, don't try to take a stretch limo into the drive-through. <laughs> the, the guy had a the guy had a back out because he couldn't make the hairpin turn. I was going to say you can't make the turn into that one. You just can't. Yeah. So, so the the universe is hinging on this question, Dave. How do you like your burgers over there, In and Out? I love the In and Out burgers, but you know I'm I'm a I'm somewhat of a burger aficionado. Okay. Um, I you know I, I my favorite burger spots around the country uh, that I like to go to, but in Southern California, In and Out burgers are 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 very very good. You They're know? the best. They're yeah. So good. Although I'm not I'm not a huge fan of their fries. I actually yeah. like the fries at Five Guys better. Amen. I'm I'm with you 100. percent Yeah. So and and the fries at Five Guys actually remind me of the fries at All American on Long Island, which is a it's an institution. It's been there for fifty some odd years. I think it's going on sixty years actually. That that All American in Massapequa, Long Island, uh, your hometown. They, they to me always had the best French fries, and so Five Guys fries are very much like the All American fries. Well, there you go. Well, you love your hometown, right? You're from Massachusetts, yeah. so there you are, Queens area. So yeah. that that that's your old stomping grounds for sure. You yeah, know, uh, and, and and we can keep going because then I can tell you. Well, when I'm in Chicago, there's a restaurant that I go to where I get a fried bologna burger. Okay, where do you go? Where do you go? Let's go ahead and talk <laughs> and about it. where do you go? I remember the name of that place. <laughs> boy, it was it's a killer fried bologna sandwich. It's like you the best what? one I've ever had. Yeah, you know what the, the the Italian sausage in Chicago, the best, absolutely yeah. the best. Um, anyway, we could go we could, on and on know, about we, this. We, we could actually do a food show. I think show, Kristen. Yeah, would you could. be up to the food I show? Would, I would. Be. I, I could. I could talk about restaurants at the park. Uh, there you go. Like, there's no tomorrow. Well, that's 33 Napa Road, <laughs> the California Grill down in Orlando. I mean, I could go on and on. I'd love to have you come on Dining at Disney and talk about food. That would be Let's awesome. do it. Okay. Let's do it. All right. We'll, we'll do it. Let's, uh, well, since we're listing off things, let's get to the Disney list guest list. And David, we've got yes. some questions for you as we wrap up the program All right. about your Disney favorites. This so, is Kristen, quiz. this is the it's quiz portion of the quiz show. Quiz time, you know, <laughs> just think about the Jeopardy music in the background. I'm not going to play it because we'll get pinged for copyright, but go ahead and play it. <laughs> Okay, so we're going we're to start with favorite park. Favorite park is the Disney Seas Park in Tokyo. Wow. And I will tell you why, because in my view, the Disney Seas Park is the crown jewel of the Disney parks around the world. It's the crown jewel. Wow. That's what I hear. I went to Tokyo Disneyland, but I didn't go to Seas. I only had one park ticket and a small opportunity to go in, and we went into uh, Tokyo Disneyland. But, man, I wish I should have gone there. We will one day. Disney Seas. Disney Seas. And I think a lot of people out there are probably nodding their heads going, oh, yeah. That, that, <laughs> it's a killer park. Put together another 3D book, David, so I can experience it here at the house. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Attraction. A what? Your favorite, favorite attraction. attraction. Favorite attraction has to be Pirates of the Caribbean at Disneyland, California. I, I will agree with that. That is an amazing attraction. My favorite. Favorite restaurant. Favorite restaurant, to me, I'd have to probably go uh, with favorite restaurant in the Disney park system. Uh, I would probably have to say... Uh, the Napa Rose at uh, Disney's California Adventure uh, at the Grand Californian Hotel. Um, and, and by the way, I will tell you that over the years, I would get people would would reach out and say, "Hey, could you get me into Club 33?" And I would always say to them, "You know what?" you're better off going to the Napa Rose. You're going to have a much better, and I would tell them, do the chef's counter. And, you know, there was oh, some yeah. cool things that you could do at the Napa Rose. But that was before 
they put in an executive chef, Andrew, in, in charge of the uh, entire food, you know, the restaurants at the Disneyland Resort. And before they did the major renovation of Club 33. And so now I will tell you that Club 33's food is really good. They have a great chef there. It's overseen by their executive chef. And, you know, so... But for most people, the Napa Rose is the most accessible for them. So I would say the Napa Rose. But then I would start to argue with myself about, <laughs> you know, well, what about the California Grill at the top of the Grand uh, of, of the Contemporary uh, when the fireworks are going off, you know? Or uh, what's the one over by the Floridian? Uh, uh, no. Uh, Narcoses. Narcoses. Thank you. I always I always have trouble remembering how to pronounce that. Narcoses is is a, is a lovely uh, fish restaurant, but but I I still go back to Napa Rose. Napa Rose is really sort of edges it out for me. I don't know. That's I amazing. Do, I do love Napa Rose, and I have not been to Club Thirty Three since they refurbished okay. it. Yeah. But between those two, back at that time, I would agree with you that Napa Rose was a better experience. We're gonna yeah. give it a chomp. <laughs> two chomps. <laughs> All right. So, favorite snack. <sighs> favorite snack is, uh, gosh. Oh. Oh, you know, I'm sorry. I also forgot to mention the flying fish yes. down, in, down in Orlando because they have a potato crusted red snapper that oh. is just, that's like their signature dish down there. And it's fantastic. You see, Kristen, I could go on and <laughs> on talking about food, but favorite <laughs> snack, you know, it's interesting. I'm not, I'm not so much a, like, uh, uh, I'm not so much a, a churro or pretzel or popcorn as I'm walking around the park. I'm more of, I like to go to the carnation and get the ice cream cone. That's it. Ooh. I like that. Yeah. I like that. So Dole Whip versus churro, you're going to go. Okay. So, so now Dole Whip is, <laughs> so, so Dole Whip is kind of a bit of a, uh, an interesting one because I like the Dole Whip a lot right? But I've also gotten the Dole Whip at the Dole Plantation in Oahu. Oh, yeah. In Hawaii. Wow. And I have to tell you, there's something about getting Dole Whip in Hawaii that, to me, just edges it out a little bit more than what you get at Disneyland. For some reason, I don't know why. It's probably the same exact thing, but it might be because I'm standing on red clay in Hawaii. You know, I don't know. Red soil in Hawaii. I, it, Hawaii? It, it's, you know, it, it could maybe it's just the fact that I'm in Hawaii having Dole Whip. You know what I mean? <laughs> right but on. I still, I still go back to a very simple soft serve vanilla ice cream cone. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Favorite animated character? Okay, so this is kind of a tough one for me because I love the Fab Five, but I mean, to me, I love Peg Leg Pete. <laughs> I, I, in fact, I'm sitting here looking at Pit. Pete up on my desk and if he wasn't so big I'd pull him down I, it's actually a gray maquette of peg leg Pete and uh -oh. I, I, I really I'd have to get a step ladder to try and get it but uh, yeah I don't know what it is and, and there's an interesting backstory to peg leg Pete and maybe this contributes to it is that you know peg leg Pete um, uh, was uh, actually a bear in the Oswald cartoons because he makes an appearance in a number of the Oswald car car cartoons, including uh, Oswald, uh, um, uh, the, the Mountie one. Um, uh, and uh, so he was a bear in, in Oswald. And then in the Mickey cartoons, uh, Peg Leg Pete becomes a cat. 
you know, which I thought was apropos as a foil to Mickey Mouse. But, you know, look, I, lo I love the Fab Five and I love those classic characters. So that's, the, I, that's I'm going to go with that as my answer is like instead of just narrowing it down to just one, I have to go with the, the group of classic characters. You're being politically correct. His favorite is Pete. His favorite, <laughs> clearly, clearly. I, I, I have an affinity to Pete. <laughs> well, I, I'm a I'm a fan of Pete, but I'm also a fan of the Big Bad Wolf. So you know, yeah. we, we we like those old characters. Here, here, let me see if I can get this maquette. Oh, now. he's gonna show. Uh, uh, no, I, I'm not gonna be. I can't get the the Pete one, but but I do have uh, Horace. Oh, like oh. Horace, ho horse, horse collar, collar. Uh, yeah. here. You know, so I, I have, you know, I have Clarabelle Cow, I have Mickey and Minnie, I, you know, I, I have an Oswald maquette up here. So, I mean, my desk is filled with, um, uh, with all kinds of, you know, tchotchkes and statues and stuff. So, so before Kristen continues, then what is your favorite piece of Disney memorabilia? That I have? That you own. Yes. <sighs> it's. Over there, you can't see it, but it's a it's a Destino uh, print that Roy Disney personal personalized. He wrote a message on it uh, to oh, me, wow. uh, uh, and, and I, that's a that's really a treasured piece. But there's a lot. I mean, the right you can see that blue cat. That's uh, an original. Uh, blue cat painting by Mike Gabriel from the Lorenzo the Cat short, That's and, and Mike Mike wrote in white China marker a message to me on the black background of that. Uh, you know, it's it's crazy. I, I've got so many crazy bits of memorabilia stuffed in this place. Uh, so it's it's just, I but I, I would say the Destino one. Yeah, That's amazing. Favorite animated movie. Favorite animated movie, hands down for me, is Pinocchio. Oh, that's and, awesome. Yeah, and, and to me, Pinocchio is the pinnacle of the art form of uh, hand-drawn animation. It, it's just such a, a, a masterfully executed animated film. Uh, and I never get tired of watching it. I, it's a fabulous story, and it's just such a rich and lush movie to look at. Still is, absolutely. Live action movie. Oh, gosh. Live action movie, I'd have to say Casablanca, but I, you know, I have like my top five, you know, it's like Casablanca, uh, The African Queen, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, um, you know, more recently, the Bourne films. I like the Bourne action movies. Uh, you know, I, I I have a, a eclectic taste, and I watch a lot of a lot of animation and a lot of uh, live action films. I go to the you know when before this pandemic, I I would go to the movies once a week. I went to the movie theater. Oh wow! Once, once a week, usually either either with Nancy or with a, a buddy of mine, and we'd see virtually everything that came out. You know, do um because you're still part of the um of the guild or the uh, the academy do you still get screeners to vote oh yeah them? yeah i i probably get somewhere in the neighborhood of of you know 60 to 60 65 75 uh screeners uh you know during the season wow. you know which is usually towards the end of the year and they they send send out those screeners to you so you know and a lot of those movies you can watch on a good home entertainment system you know if you have a large flat panel screen which a lot of people have now um but there's certain movies you really need to go see on a big screen uh you know i'm i'm a big advocate it, it was funny i walked in on nancy um she, she was exercising on an elliptical and and she had uh, uh, um, Ford, Ford versus Ferrari on uh, she was watching and and she was watching it on a smaller flat panel in the exercise room and and I said well you know how do you like it she was ah, it's a little hard to get into I go because this is a movie you have to see on a big screen, you know, it's like, you know, that the car racing and everything, you know, you, you don't get immersed into that movie unless you're seeing it. I saw that film, by the way, 
on an IMAX screen. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I, I'll go see most of those kinds of movies on an IMAX screen if they're, if they're showing it in IMAX, you know? That's amazing. Your favorite Disney song? <sighs> favorite Disney song is got to be Wish Upon a Star. Great. That's a good one. Yeah. They're all good. And favorite Disney book that you did not write? Favorite Disney uh, would be Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson's uh, The Illusion of Life. Disney animation, The Illusion of Life. It is the Bible of the animation industry. It really is. So good. So good. If you had to take a time machine back and rescue an attraction from any Disney park and bring it back to life and stick it in a, in, in a, in a theme park currently, which one would you rescue? Well, I, I, I have to tell you what's, what's going through my head right now is uh, the um, uh, adventure through inner space. Oh, yeah. uh, I never got to actually go through that attraction. It was gone by the time I got to Disneyland. Uh, but I, I've done a lot of uh, research on it, and I've, I've actually looked at uh, film footage of going through that, and I think that something like that would be really cool with today's technology. Absolutely. As, as you worked with Disney in special projects and different things of that, that brought together everything that you've done with the company, you know, all the intellectual properties, all the animation, all the technology, all the storytelling, which one of those projects is your favorite and why? You know, I, I can't give you an answer to that, believe it or not, because it's like asking somebody who their favorite child is. You know, you, you honestly can't pick one over the other uh, because it's just not fair. Uh, because each project has its own attributes, its own memories, its own, you know, visceral feeling about what you did on it, you know? And I, and I just feel as though I, I, you know, when people say, what's the favorite film you worked on? I, that's my same answer. It's like, you, you just can't pick one because it's trying to choose who your favorite child is. And, you know, even though you didn't create it yourself, you worked with a fabulous team of people on all of these projects, you know, it, it's just so difficult to say, oh, this is my most favorite or this, this one over here. You know, as I said earlier, I, I you know, sometimes when somebody says, what's the, my most favorite film I worked on, I, I give them that answer, like, you can't choose, you know, who your favorite child is, but... You know, who framed Roger Rabbit, but it was for all these other reasons. You know, I lived in London, I made all these friends internationally, and, you know, worked with this incredibly diverse group of people, and, you know, on a project that we all believed in, and we took an animation technique to the nth degree, and, you know, it still holds up, and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I, I can't sit there and and say well which which one out of out of literally hundreds i mean just in special projects we did over 600 projects you know big and small i mean i sit there and go well you know maybe for nighttime spectaculars i i kind of like world of color uh you know that was a fun project to get off the ground uh with the, you know be part of that whole team of people and that was steve davidson the the show designer he was the the brains behind that whole operation uh but you know you bringing together engineers and artists and animation people and show you know show producers and this and that and, and all of that's getting you know, whipped together in a bowl as a recipe and out pours World of Color. Uh, and, you know, we, we did another nighttime spectacular for Paris, uh, Paris Dreams, and we made, you know, Quasimodo climb, you know, he climbed all over the, um, uh, the castle at Paris Disneyland 
uh, as, a, as part of a projection that was done. And, and that was kind of fun. And he was singing, uh, uh, what, what's the title song? Uh, uh, is it Out There or? Uh, I can't from, uh, from, uh, from Hunchback. From Hunchback. Yeah. Oh, gosh, uh, so many songs on there. Yeah, but anyway, he's, he's singing the song in French. Uh, that's awesome. Yes. And, cli- and as he climbs around the castle and he's projected on the castle as he's climbing around. So that's like pretty fantastic. You know, I mean, look, you know, every one of these things has, has great memories and, you know, I, I could ramble on and on about it, but it, it's just so difficult to, to say one over the, over another, you know, it's just tough. If you were to spend, you know, 30 minutes with Walt Disney and do anything with Walt, ask him questions. Uh, What would you do in that time of 30 minutes that you'd spend with Walt Disney? Well, I, if I could do it, I would try and convince him to quit smoking so that he would have lived another 15 or 20 years because God knows what he would have been able to accomplish had he had those many years uh, ahead of him. And, and honestly, uh, that's just off the top of my head. I really would, would just beg him to stop smoking. I, I, if I could get transported to the thirties and convince him never to smoke again, you know, uh, you know, beam me back to the thirties with like a couple of cartons of nicotine patches, you know, to give to him and tell him not to smoke cigarettes anymore. Right. That, that might be it. There, there's something about clean living. You know, give yourself a chance and, you know, and listen, every, everybody's got a vice and, you know, something he, uh, you know, he was smoking during a time when uh, they didn't know the full health effects and, and doctors were, were recommending people take up smoking to calm their nerves. You know, I mean, you know, oh, no, go, no. go figure, you know, it's a product of yeah, the time. It was, it was yeah. promoted for health benefits, yeah. not realizing all of the consequences that we know today today yeah yeah Yeah. this is true david one last thing um to the disney fan listening and watching the show um give them give them the elevator pitch of why this book is a must-have because we all know chris and i know that this is a must-have book for your collection but why why should they have this book look this book if anything is a piece of history uh, it's showcasing things that no longer exist anymore. And if you're a fan of Disney and the Disney parks, this is a must have for your library because you get to see things in this book that no longer exist. And, and that in and of itself is just a wonderful thing. I love it. Uh, David Bossert. Thank you so much for being here today. I apologize for mis- mispronouncing your name earlier in the show because I just, I, I, I'm so excited to talk to you. That's okay. <laughs> it's totally fine. Uh, hey, listen, you know, I answer to pretty much anything like, hey, bud, or you, know, hey, you, you know, get over here, whatever. Uh, I'm totally fine with that. I, I, oftentimes people will say Bosart instead of Bossert. Uh, so, and, and, and it's funny with that name, the first four letters, uh, that's what people used to, they used to call me, but not pronounce boss. They used to call me boss. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> boss. Well, I, I, boss yeah. for short. No, no, boss is great. You know, I, I typically, my, my news background, uh, I would write down the name of the guest and hyphenate it and do all the little phonetic writing so that when I was editing copy for the news, when I would read the news, I would simply read it the way it was phonetically pronounced. But of course, I didn't do it for this show and it always gets me into trouble. But uh, <laughs> so having, it's totally, uh, fine. You know, totally having, fine. Well, thank you so much. For, thank you. We went over, uh, but it was time well spent. Once again, the book is 3D Disneyland, Disneyland like you've never seen it before. And uh, we'll have links to check it out at, uh, once again, David, uh, why don't you tell our audience where they can go ahead and pre-order this book? So if you want to pre-order the book that's signed by both myself and the photographer, Ted Kiersey, uh, and it's going to be a numbered book with a nice holographic emblem uh, in it. Uh, There's only going to be 750 signed. That's it. You can order that at a 20% discount and free shipping at theoldmillpress.com. The Old Mill Press, one word. 
Awesome. Once again, you can also follow him on Instagram, Facebook. You got a Patreon there because you have some awesome content for your Patreons, your your patrons, if you will, as well as your YouTube channel, which is also great because you have these minute long segments that run and educating people all the way from you know different cultures, your different travels, um, the different things and, that you're into. And by the way, I will tell you that on the Patreon, uh, I am just trying to build an audience of people. And I tell them, you know, do a dollar a month. What's a dollar? But if we get a community of people each doing a dollar, it adds up because we're out looking for lost films. I have a, a, a piece of film from World War II with Walt in it uh, that is being, uh, that's being restored. Uh, this is something we found, you know, of course, we, we, brought, we, we brought back the uh, piece of uh, Oswald film from Japan. And there's other films that I'm searching for. And when we find them, we're getting copies of them and we're doing some restoration work on it. So it takes a community to do some of this stuff. He's like the Indiana Jones for the Disney company. <laughs> um, between him and Roy just teaming up on different projects, man, I'm glad you guys are on the case and making sure that the legacy and the history is there for everyone to enjoy. So thank you so much for your time. Hey, it was a pleasure being here and thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And Kristen, we're going to talk food at some yes, point. Yes, we are. Absolutely. Definitely. We'll definitely do it. Thank you guys so much. Once again, team, thank you so much to David and uh, spending time with us talking about the book. I can't wait for it myself. It's going to be awesome. Uh, Kristen, where can people follow you? They can check me out at diningatdisney.com. There you can also check out the Dining at Disney podcast, the blogs there, and all of the links to our social media. Absolutely. You can follow me, Al John Go, on Instagram. I post a lot of music, uh, guitar related questions. You know, choosing a guitar for me, uh, of the ones <laughs> that I help build for my company, is a little bit like Dave's. I, I, don't, I can't just choose one. I have to choose everything, but uh, follow me there. Also, the Disney list, you can follow us on iHeartRadio. You can also check us out, of course, part of the Source of Radio Network at srsounds.com. All Disney music, all day long, fan-run station with all kinds of free apps for you to download and enjoy. We do pay licensing, but we do it because we love you, the Disney fan. Thank you so much for following us. The Disney list as well on all social media. Thank you to our guest, David Bossert. And uh, he is the boss, and I hope he will come back. Uh, thank you so much once again, Dave, for joining us. Thank you, guys. All right. This has been another Disney List. We'll see you next time. This podcast is not affiliated with the Walt Disney Company or its holdings. It is intended for 